welcome to Basel Book Company's virtual event series. It is day 4,492 of us being in business. And though I mentioned a few upcoming events, they all pale in comparison to tonight's event. We are so honored to welcome back um, S.A. Cosby, who is uh, author of Razor Blade Tears. Um, he was here last year for Blacktop Wasteland in conversation with Carol E. Barrowman. And it was such a success that we are having a return engagement. The new book has just hit the New York Times bestsellers and is winning uh, raves, 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 including from Carol V. Bell on the NPR website who wrote, reading razor blade tears is a visceral full body experience, a sharp jolt to the heart and a treat for the senses. S.A. Cosby's moody Southern thriller marries the skillful action and plotting of Lee Child with the atmosphere and insight of Attica Locke. Cosby's um, New York Blacktop Wasteland was a New York Times editor's choice and Goodreads choice semi-finalist. Uh, he's also written Blood Brotherhood of the Blade and My Darkest Prayer. He won the Anthony Award for Best Short Story. And I'm guessing if we ever have the honor of hosting him again, the list of awards will be a lot longer. We're so honored to have one of our favorite conversation partners, Carol E. Barrowman, English professor and director of creative studies and writing at Alverno College, a regular contributor of books to TMJ4's Morning Blend and book reviewer for the Star Tribune and Journal Sentinel. She's the co-author of the Hollow Earth series and has also written comics for DC and Titan, as well as some memoirs and, um, and things that we don't even know about. <laughs> So with that said, welcome everybody. I'm turning things over to Carol. Thank you. So All much. right. I, 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 good, good evening, everyone. And, and, and Sean, hello to you again. Um, I have to start out with my Bucks hat on here or my husband who is a major <laughs> sports fan and superstitious to the end about sports. And I had this on the other <laughs> night when we won. So um, I'm not going to tell him, but I'm going to go, yay, go Bucks!" And then I'm going to just take it off. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be How awesome. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. Thank you. Thank you for having me back. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> How are you? I, I'm, I am. I'm well, and I'm so excited to have you um, to be in conversation with you again. But I have to start with the the the, the big question here, um, and it's kind of two questions. Where were you, and what were you doing? If you can share when you realized <laughs> you that that um, razor razor blade tears had made the New York Times bestseller list. I was actually sitting at my, I have a lap desk because I write in a recliner. So I was actually sitting in my recliner, working on some stuff. And my editor at Flatiron called me and she called me, during, it was the middle of the day. And she doesn't usually call me in the middle of the day. And so I answered it and I'm like, hello. And she was just screaming, you're a New York Times bestseller. And it was like, oh my God. And then my agent called and then it blew up on online. And it was just, it was one of those moments where it was almost like you had an out of body experience. It was like I was watching it happen as and it was like I can't believe this is happening to me of all people and it's happening now with this book um and I'm incredibly incredibly moved and honored um that so many people have embraced the book and have and, and I've gotten so many nice um uh, uh mentions on social media and, and people that have reached out to me and really have taken the book um as I intended it to be taken and so uh for me it's just I was telling a friend of mine you know it don't matter what happens I'm gonna say that forever. I'm like, I'm gonna work that into every conversation. As <laughs> like, you should. Well, like if we go to a restaurant, <laughs> if we go to a restaurant, they're gonna ask me, what do you have for dinner, sir? <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I'm a New York Times bestselling author. So maybe I'll just have the chicken. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> You should just have t-shirts no, made. A, uh, I know, that's what somebody said. I mean, but it's a dream come true. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think anybody gets into writing for that honor specifically, but it is an honor that you think about. It's something that's always in the back of your head. And, oh, sure. you know, it's one of, it's an, it's an exclusive club. And there are people that I've admired as writers for a long time who are members of the club, of that club. And, and now I, I am as well. So it's just an incredible, incredible feeling. That's, it's so exciting. I, I, I think those of us who have been, um, uh, have read a lot of your work and we're so excited to see I think I probably screamed for at least two or three minutes you know um it, when and I I saw your post it was your post that I saw so right. it was like I thought it was a wonderful it, it so so well deserved um 
I, I don't know why Blacktop Thank Wasteland you. didn't make it on there either because I love that one, but we'll take what we can and let's push it on there in paperback, yeah. right? Well, you know, Blacktop won a lot of awards. It won the ITW, it won the LA uh, Book uh, Circle Award. Mm -hmm. um, it's nominated for the Anthony, the Barry, and the McCavity. So I got I got no problems with Blacktop. Uh, it's the little outlaw book that could, and I, I love it just as much as I love Raceway to You. Yeah, I am. Um... Yeah, it, it's the, the both of them are are just stellar in 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 my opinion. So for those folks who are joining us, who um, for whatever reason um, are uh, are not down are not downtown in the Deer District already, um, let's uh, can you give us your give us your pitch? I mean, tell us tell us um, right. how p pitch uh, Ra Razor Blade Tears to us. Okay. All right, so basically Razor Blade Tears is a story of two fathers, one black, one white, both ex-cons, whose sons, gay sons, are married to each other. And as the book opens, these young men are murdered. And so these two fathers, who were not accepting of their son's sexuality, decide to investigate the crime to get revenge for their murdered boys, but also seek redemption for themselves to try to treat their boys better in death than they ever did in life. And it takes place in, in, in a place that's my heart and my home, Southeast of Virginia. And uh, it, it was a book that was uh, interesting to write, difficult to write at times, but one that I'm very, very proud of. That, that, that's, that was great summary. So let me pull that apart, tease that out a little bit. What was interesting about it to write and, and what were the elements that were the most, that were the difficult things? Right. So for me, what was interesting about it was, you know, I'm, I'm a native Southerner. I grew up and I was born in Virginia and I've, I've lived here most of my life, except for a couple of brief excursions where I went out and did a whole Jack Kerouac thing. But that's another <laughs> story for another day. But uh, <laughs> um, but I wanted what was interesting to me was I wanted to take these two characters who could who feel like they couldn't be more different and and show how similar they are and also show what they have in common while at the same time uh, illuminating the things that they can learn from each other. So that was the interesting part. And I, I often say, you know, if you're a Southerner, I have more in common than somebody from the South than I would have with anyone from a metropolitan area. And so a lot of times people that live in the South don't want to acknowledge that. And so I really wanted to hammer that point home that these two men from opposite ends of the social spectrum, uh, they are united by not only the, the, the tragic murder of their sons, but by their, their circumstances and their situations. So that was interesting. The parts that were difficult were really the emotional weight of talking about grief through an entire book. It, it, it was, I, I'm, I, when I write, I feel things very deeply. And it was just every day I went to write in every chapter, even there's, when there's humor, it's still the story of these two young men who have died and these two fathers who feel like they'll never speak to their sons again. And so just kind of, uh, of, of working through that day in and day out as I wrote the book was a little difficult, but I think ultimately it helped me as a writer because it allowed me to give these characters a voice and to maybe show how a more positive way to deal with grief and regret and trying to uh, achieve redemption. You know, one of, I am, I'm glad, I mean, in a way, I'm glad that that was your struggle because as a reader, I found that to be also in a good way, the struggle that you're going through with the characters. Um, you know, the, the, the idea, and I think I said this in my own review, that it, it reminded me so much of some of the themes that you see in a Faulkner novel, right? The idea that family has ties that are that are stronger than just about anything else, you know, that old fierce pull of blood. Um, but yet you took that in a little different way, right? Because these two men had, yeah. in a sense, disassociated themselves with their sons, and now they had to deal mm -hmm. with the consequences of that. Yeah, I mean, and definitely, you know, writers like Faulkner and, and Flannery O'Connor and Eudora Welty and Charles Williford and, and William Gay and Ernest J. Gaines and folks like that definitely influenced my writing because I think there is a unique specificity to Southern writing. I mean, I, I've said this before, I think, you know, Southern writing has its own holy trinity, which is race, class, and sex. Those are the three foundational principles of, of, of all, I think all, especially what we call Southern Gothic or Southern literature. And so for me, I wanted to talk about those things, but in a way 
that was a little more modern, a little more updated uh, for the times. But also, I did not want these two characters to, quote unquote, get off the hook. You know, I wanted them to confront their prejudice. I wanted them to be confronted about their prejudice. I wanted, you know, I tried to do a thing throughout the book where nobody ever lets them get off the hook, that people call them on their BS constantly until they get to a point where they can do it for each other and for themselves. And by the end of the book, I think they get to a point where they can acknowledge how much time they wasted by holding on to some weird preconceived notion of what quote unquote masculinity is and what that means. And so, but I do, you know, that Faulkner ass quote, you know, the past is uh is uh never dead. The past is never past. Yeah. Yeah, this past never the past. Uh yeah, it it definitely uh influenced this book. Um, I was thinking about that because both Buddy Lee and Ike have made mistakes in the past that you know you could make the argument that their bad behavior in the past is way worse and way more problematic than who Isaiah and Derek love. You know, right. love is never going to be a problem. No. And so these two men who are ex-cons who have who have hurt people, who have, have killed people, you know, uh, their prop, their issues in the past are way more problematic than than uh, two men who love each other and are trying to build a life with their daughter. And so I really wanted to discuss that and talk about it. But at the same time, I wanted to do it in a way that was interesting and hopefully exciting. Uh, you know, a, a little bit of a honey makes the medicine go down. So. Well, it it, it, it it was exciting. I'm going to come back to that in, in a minute because it seems to me that the, the women in the, the novel mostly... Um, let's no no spoilers or anything but but mostly um ike uh i ike's wife right it seems to me Mm -hmm. that she that that she was sort of the the chorus the greek chorus in a way because Mm -hmm. she calls him right exactly she calls him out as many times as anybody else yes exactly i think you know i think nobody can hold you accountable in the way that somebody who loves you can hold you accountable and, you know, she's lost. She's lost her son. And so she is not, she does not have time for Ike's macho BS, you know? Right. And so she holds him accountable again and again, you know, even the, the second chapter at the funeral, you know? And, and so I wanted her to be a character that, like you said, was that Greek chorus, was that conscience to a certain extent. But also I wanted her to be sort of my voice to characters and people like Ike and Buddy, where I'm saying to them, all the stuff that you think important is important doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that you love the people in your life, regardless of who they lay down with at night and accept them for the full version of themselves. And so I tried to use her definitely as that that linchpin. Um, and and hopefully I, I succeeded because, you know, I know Ike and Buddy Lee are tough characters at the beginning to like. Um, but I hope by the end of the book, they you've seen them grow. And through that growth, you can have a, a better understanding of them as characters. I, I'm glad. I'm glad you said that because I did not like Ike in the beginning, um, because we come mm-hmm. into the novel really f- through Ike, right? Um, and I know in a little mm-hmm, bit yeah. you're gonna you're gonna read that 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 initial chapter, and and I'm glad that we came into the novel that way because it also sets the story mm-hmm. in a in, in the political and a racial context that that Mm -hmm. you pull through in the the rest of the book but i did not i didn't like buddy either but i really didn't like ike and and i i i i felt that um one of the most amazing things you did in this book is that i was sobbing by the end right i mean there's a couple other places where the grief weighs heavy on you and and anyone who knows me who's here watching us here they know i'm not a kleenex person right i am not an easy sobber <laughs> doesn't matter what right <laughs> um but right. i just i just had to put it down a couple of times and 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 there were just so many places where um the grief became for me um a very visceral but almost a character that they're lumbering through yeah. Because we should say what they decide to do is they're going to take this, take it upon themselves to find who murdered their boys. Mm-hmm. And I right. feel like, and I they, think that, the grief. Yeah, I was going to say, I think the grief is what is what drives the violence. Their their violence is a response to their grief, and it's in equal measure. So as bad as the grief is, they have to visit that violence upon their enemies, and 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 I think. With Ike, I didn't particularly like Ike at the beginning either. And I wanted to 
work really hard to show people that I, I firmly believe this as a personal, uh, just, I, I, I believe no one is beyond redemption. I, but the thing about redemption is it's not a gift that's given to you. Redemption is work. You know, I, I like to akin redemption to a jigsaw puzzle that somebody given to you and they've taken it apart. You have to work to put that together. And I wanted I to work for that redemption because I think he was worthy of it. I think he was worth redeeming. And I wanted him to come to a place where he was able to not only recognize his mistakes with his son, but also realize that he can, he has a, a chance to maybe be a better person. And I wanted to talk about toxic masculinity, tragic masculinity, mm -hmm. homophobia, and all of that within the context of the community that I, I grew up in, you know? And so, um, it was definitely, you know, the, the book is, for people who haven't read the book, the book is very violent. But I, yes. I, I feel like you can write, you can write violence if your story earns it, if you can earn that justification. And I can't think of any more valid justification than going after the murders of your child. I just, you know, and so uh, that was a, a, big, a, a big part of the story. Um, but same thing with Buddy Lee, to a lesser extent, I did. I wanted them to be equals, but I'm telling the story sort of through Ike's point of view. But Buddy Lee as well. I wanted him to learn and grow. He's someone I've seen him described in reviews as casually racist, and I think that's a good description. He doesn't yeah. even realize that he's racist until towards the end of the book. He has this anecdote about his grandfather, and I wanted to talk about that because in the real world, we're not having those conversations. The people no. that need to have those conversations aren't having them, and so it's my book. And so I take a, a, a black man of a certain age and a white man of a certain age, and I force them to talk. And I, I force them to look at the bigger picture. And I wanted to really expose that um, because I think if we talk, if we discuss things, if we're honest, and honesty is hard, there is a possibility to move forward. But it's, you know, it's, it's difficult. It's not easy. And, you know, somebody said, you know, if their sons hadn't been killed, they wouldn't be doing this. And that's true. If they right. it, it took anything short anything short of death would not have gotten them to the place they are right absolutely and i think i think what the other the other thing that that i particularly liked about the characters is is that you sort of inverted some tropes too with them so, so you've got ike as being sort of the serious um uh the more serious i think of the two whereas some of the humor that we get in the book comes a little more from buddy lee and often in buddy yeah. movies it's the black guy that's the 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 one that's right there the, the just for the humor are, right the and I, I like the fact that yeah. you played that <laughs> yeah i wanted to flip that on on his head i'm a, I'm a child of the 80s so i grew up with like lethal weapon and <laughs> right. uh i grew up watching like spencer for hire and all of that stuff. And so, you know, a lot of times in those buddy pictures, the black character is either the super serious, benevolent sociopath sidekick or the comic relief. And so with Buddy Lee, I wanted to switch it because I wanted to show that, you know, Buddy sees Ike as a success. It's like, you got this new truck, you own your own landscaping business. And Ike doesn't really see himself as a success because he's still struggling. You know, he's a, a black man in a small Southern town. So any scrap of success he's gotten he's worked really hard for it and he's really he, he's sort of scared of losing it until he gets to a point where he realizes it doesn't matter if the people who killed his son get away with it and so he's definitely the more serious of the two and buddy lee gets all the good lines i mean i, I thought I, I did that at first uh, in the initial draft and then it just worked so i just kept doing it uh all the way through uh but buddy lee has his moments of of quiet uh, contemplative uh, 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 seriousness, and you know, there's a scene where he talks with his ex-wife, and he's he's very honest about his mistakes and her mistakes in regards to their son. And I, again, I think the job of a novelist or a writer or or anybody that's creative is to find the truth. You know, you use lie as you make up stories to get to the truth. And um, you know, I I think that's ultimately what I'm trying to do every time I, I write a book. Well, and, and as you did with Blacktop Wasteland, you know, in, in my notes here, I just, I wrote down some, some of the descriptions uh, I just love. And, and one of them, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot, that I, and I don't even remember who says it, but it just came into my head. Um, they, they, their, their work, the, the, the two son, the two sons, um, or one of the sons is a, 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 a baker and an artist as a baker, right? Yeah. And works in the, mm -hmm. and so. Yeah, he's a pastry artist. 
he's a pastry artist and which is am amazing anyway and so then i have to ask you in a little while right. to tell us if you bake right but anyway what, <laughs> one of the, so, somebody's line where you don't kill you don't kill people for a you know effing buttercream frosting yeah right? yeah yeah that's buddy lee says that yeah right which <laughs> no you know, I mean, in the middle yeah. of this you know horrible it, scene he's saying that and it's like <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think Gallo's humor is is important. I think I, I think the, the reactions that we have to traumatic situations can vary. You can be very right. serious. You can go inward. And then sometimes you, you just got to laugh. You know, I, I remember I had a really uh, scary car accident. I wasn't hurt, but it was really scary. And after I realized I was OK, I laughed for like a full minute. And, and so those scenes where they're like dealing with incredibly serious, dangerous uh, uh, circumstances, you know, Buddy Lee is there, and also Buddy Lee's humor is his coping mechanism right. as a character. That's the way he gets through things. And so, at first, it annoys Ike, but then after a while, Ike learns to appreciate it, and he might say a couple jokes of his own. And so, you know, they again showing their growth, their change, how they affect each other uh, was really important to me. But I, I know, uh, I, I do like to use pretty elaborate similes and metaphors. I've kind of been dinged on that by some people, but I just like it. I love the sound of language. I love creating phrases or using a phraseology that is unique, you know, and, specific, and of course, because I'm from the South, there's a whole different syntax and vernacular that exists uh, where I'm from. And so I like to bring that uh, to my writing when I can. And and here's one, here's here's one that, that does all of what you're just saying. And I think it's from Buddy and it, it's early on. It's like in the first 60 pages or something. He's, and he says that his uncles were outlaws and his mother was Jesus all day. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's the South. That's the South. And a lot of times that's the South. Your mama is 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 going to church on Sunday as your dad is coming in from hanging out Saturday night. And I, I think that it, that is a, a part of the Southern experience. Not everybody's experience. But that's right. the part that I have experienced personally, and I I, I love bringing that uh, to my stories because I think the the South and 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 the, and the South as a region has an inc an incredibly deep well of material to tell stories about, and I'm just very lucky that I've been able to uh, to tap that um, that mind just a little bit, um, and I mean there are people who did it way before me and did it way better, but I'm just very lucky that I'm able to uh, contribute to that uh to that history i hope <laughs> yeah i i would say there's no question about that uh, the other the uh, the couple of other um you talked a little earlier about your sort of the literary influences that 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 you've that, that you've had on this there's also um i'm thinking and and i this just might be the english major in me or the english teacher in me but i'm thinking there's some <laughs> film illusions worked in here oh, and yeah. i'm yeah, not yeah, gonna definitely. give this I'm not, and and obvi I think one of the more violent sections of the novel um, mm. uh, has um, uh, ha made me think of another. I'm not going to. I I don't want to say what the film is because it'll <laughs> give away. But I'm hoping that right. you know what I'm talking about, right? Um, yeah. And, and yeah. Definitely. Right. Uh, so so say a little bit about the a little more about the violence in this and 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 for me it mm. it it allowed me to read that scene with less horror you know are those mm -hmm. it's more than one yeah. scene obviously but i'm i'm a cinephile i love movies i grew up watching you know burt reynolds uh, uh 1970s 1980s uh you know his his b movies like gator and white lightning and <laughs> i remember watching those movies as a kid and and really falling in love with those movies because they a lot of times there weren't a lot of people of color in those movies but i knew those characters I right. knew those situations. And so that's always had a big influence on me. Uh, movies like um, Hell or High Water, uh, which is a film from a few years ago, it was a big influence on me. Uh, 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 there's an old B movie from the 70s called Rolling Thunder with William Devane. Mm. And it's the first appearance of Tom, Tommy Lee Jones. And that movie was a huge influence on the book because it, 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 was, it showed me a way to use, again, like I said previously, use violence as an expression of grief. You know, there's a scene in the beginning of the book uh, about the first 70 pages mm -hmm. where, and I don't want to give nothing, no, too much away, but 
I can Buddy Lee catch up with someone who may be involved. And there's a vi- violence breaks out. But that violence is, it's multifaceted because not only are they angry because this person possibly has something to do with their children being killed, but for Ike, he's angry that he's given in to this side of himself that he thought he had locked away. He's angry that he's become Riot, which was his nickname when he was in prison. And all of that is expressed in the way that he behaves during that scene. Um, and, and later on, there's a scene at a farmhouse, uh, uh, which is a shootout. And again, it's still violent, but now these two men have someone they're trying to protect. And the violence right. takes on a different form and, and, and a different shape. And it's not just about the revenge. It's about trying to salvage the future. And so I, I know intrinsically that it's th- that the violence in the book is not going to be for everyone and that's i understand that completely but at the same time i i don't think we should shy away from violence i think violence should have consequences in fiction the thing i hate the worst the most mm-hmm. i should say either a movie or a book is when you see like say a private detective he gets beat up and he gets punched in the ribs and he gets thrown down the stairs and then two minutes later he's up drinking some whiskey and I, I mean, for me, real violence has consequences. Real violence is ugly and it hurts. And I think we do a disservice to readers uh, when we don't emphasize that. We don't show that it has lasting effects, not just physically, but also mentally. There's a scene in the book where Ike does something that on its surface, there's a scene at, the, uh, at his, at his uh, shop when he's confronted by some people. And on its surface, that's a very badass scene. You know, that's very... Uh, you know, it's very, uh, like I said, a white light and gator-ish scene. Mm-hmm. But then after that scene comes to an end, he has a lot of doubts inside of him. He's scared. He's afraid. And I really wanted to hammer that home, that those two things are not mutually exclusive. You can do these acts of violence. You can be this quote-unquote badass, but you're a human being and you can still be afraid. You can still realize that maybe you've set something in motion that you can't control. And, uh, and so I, I definitely wanted to, to emphasize that. Well, and, and and I think I think you did one of because for me the violence, he, you know, obviously the more and, and he the more he faces the consequences of his violence, the more he's forced to face his grief. And so you've not you never mm-hmm. in the book at all, ever do you you never separate those two. And the and the one thing that begins to work its way in um, as we move on in the story, and we should say that. The, there's a really good suspenseful mystery woven in on this too, right? Yeah. I mean, right. we're, we're spending yeah, oh yeah, a lot of definitely. time with the, these two characters, but there's a <laughs> there's a really suspenseful plot that is driving this too. But for me, Ike could, and even Buddy, but Ike for me, uh, he had to forgive himself. You know, he had to he yeah. had to let and and to me, that's when you that's when everything changes and it's not that when they figure things out and the, and you get your big the big ending for me it was that it was him figuring out that i i'm hurting myself here this i, I gotta mm-hmm. forgive myself otherwise yeah, ariana the granddaughter isn't mm-hmm. gonna have a future mm-hmm. exactly exactly there, there's a thing i did in the book and i don't know how many people picked up on it but in the first 25 chapters he doesn't call her his granddaughter no not he at calls all her the, the girl the little right. girl the girl the child it's not until he realizes that you know he has to forgive himself and that this child this little girl his granddaughter deserves a chance at life at happiness and that's what matters there's a scene also where ike is with someone so part of the plot is that the two main characters are trying to solve this murder of their sons and they get a witness. They find a witness who may know something about it. And so there's a scene where Ike is with this witness and he's talking, and it's a woman, and he's talking to her. And, you know, she's very, trying to be very tough, trying to exude confidence. And that was for me when I began to really see as the writer, Ike letting his guard mm-hmm. down and, and being honest with this person, you know, that, you know, this, you know, you're, you're bank, he's talking to her and like, this person that you're trying to protect doesn't love you and they don't care about you and you know i'm gonna protect you for no other reason than you're a person right and you're worthy of protection because you are a person who is alive you know and 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 i think that was the beginning of his empathy also with buddy lee also to a lesser extent but i think 
it, 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 ironically, I think Buddy Lee had, I think Ike he had, had further empathy. to go with that aspect. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Buddy Lee had way more empathy. And I think Ike had further to go with that. Um, right. But then, like I said, but, uh, yeah, Buddy Lee was somebody who had to deal with his, his, in, his, his uh, uh, insular racism and, and casual prejudice that he wouldn't even wear he had until the end. Right. So, again, it was just, it was great being able to talk about those issues within the confines of a crime novel. Yeah, I think so too. And I think that's a great scene um, when he's um, talking to the to the woman because you, you, it, now that I'm thinking about it, it makes you wonder if um, in the world of, of your, that you created in that novel, is he thinking he could, he should have said those things to his son, right? In a way. Yeah. Some of, oh, definitely. Some of what, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, definitely. Definitely. I, it's, it's, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think... Um, you and I, right before we started this, we had a, a little bit of a, a conversation about this first chapter, and I'm going to ask if you would read this <laughs> yeah. read to us, but let, let me set a little context for those of you who were not in on the backstage conversation. Um, and I'm going to, this is a little story of mine, a quick story. Um, uh, my, my, my books are a middle grade for middle grade, third through ninth grade. And then I have some young adult novels, but my middle grade series, um, I visit a lot of schools. And um, I was visiting a school and I said, I asked them a question from the prologue of my first book. And mm -hmm. it became very clear that not one person in this group of 50 <laughs> kids had read the prologue. And so I looked at him and I was like, you don't read prologues? No, because if it was important, it should be a chapter. And I did a little research. And even in my college classrooms, a lot of times adult readers skip the prologue and I was appalled. So now I've stopped writing <laughs> prologues. So yeah. now, now your story. So this first chapter was a prologue and my wonderful editor at Flatiron, Christine Kapachik, uh, she said, you know, it should just be the first chapter. And I said, it's only two pages. It was me sort of trying to set the scene, set the tone. And she's like, you can do that with the first chapter. And she, said the same thing you did she said we do to make it a prologue nobody's gonna read it they're gonna <laughs> skip it and so this 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 two two page first chapter kind of a uh, sets the scene uh it create it introduces ike and it tells you a lot about him in the first couple pages and uh i'll just read you some of it now <clears throat> skip. ike tried to remember a time when men with badges come into his door early in the morning or at anything other than heartbreak and misery but try as he might, nothing came to mind. The two men stood side by side on the small concrete landing of his front step with their hands on their belts near their badges and their guns. The morning sun made the badges glimmer like gold nuggets. The two cops were a study in contrast. One was a tall but wiry Asian man. He was all sharp angles and hard edges. The other was a florid faced white man he was built like a power lifter with a massive head sitting atop a wide neck. They both wore white dress shirts with clip on ties. The power lifter had sweat stains spreading uh, down from his armpits that vaguely resembled maps of England and Ireland, respectively. Ike's queasy stomach began to do somersaults. He was 15 years removed from Coldwater State Penitentiary. He had bucked the recidivism rates ever since he'd walked out of that festering wound. Not so much as a speeding ticket in all those years. Yet here he was with his tongue dry and the back of his throat burning as the two cops stared down at him. It was bad enough being a black man in the good old US of A and talking to the cops. You always felt like you were on the edge of some imaginary precipice. If you were an ex-con, it felt like that precipice was coated in bacon grease. Yes, Ike said. Sir, I'm Detective Oplata. This is my partner, Detective Robbins. May we come in? What for? Ike asked. Laplata sighed. It came out low and long like the bottom note in a blues song. Ike tensed. Laplata glanced at Robbins. Robbins shrugged. And then Laplata's head dipped down. Then he raised it again. Ike had learned to pick up on body language when he was inside. There was no aggression in their stances, not anymore at least not any more than most cops exuded on a normal 12 hour shift. 
The way LaPlata's head had dropped was almost sad. Sir, do you have a son named Isaiah Randolph? He said finally. And that was when he knew. He knew it like he knew when a fight was about to break out in the yard, like he knew when a crackhead was going to try to stab him for a bag back in the day. Like he knew, just knew in his gut that his homeboy Luther had seen his last sunset the night he'd gone home with that girl from the satellite bar. It was like a sixth sense, a preternatural ability to sense a tragedy seconds before it became a reality. What's happened to my son, Detective LaPlata? Ike asked, already knowing the answer, knowing it in his bones, knowing his life would never be the same. Great. That, that, I mean, it does. It sets up Ike. It sets up the context. It sets up racism. It sets up the whole thread that runs through it. And it's a chapter, not a prologue. <laughs> I think I'm going to make a prologue next time just because. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm contrarian like that. <laughs> I shouldn't have told you. I shouldn't have told you. I shouldn't have told you. <laughs> So um, <laughs> I, I, I wanted to open it up for a conversation and see if we have any um, of our other viewers here that, that would like to ask a question or follow up with something that we've talked about here. And um, I'm going to just go down. Uh, I think I can see if we've got any questions here. Um, let's see. No. Uh, so if you want to type in a question and I can ask it or um, I think Dan, Daniel, can folks have, um, are they able to ask a question if anyone has one? Here we go. Okay. All right, so this is from Maggie Smith. Um, where, uh, right. where do you get your ideas? <laughs> um, I used to say the newspaper, but now it's the internet. I read a lot of stories on the internet. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, uh, I'm, I'm a, a weird news junkie. So I'm always always reading uh, websites like Listverse uh, and stuff like that, where uh, not quite paranormal things are happening or weird stories. Uh, but then also, a lot of times, some of my ideas come from, uh, you know, the stories that I want to tell. I, I come up like I'll think about a buddy cop picture, but I want to like I want to do it differently, or I want to do a heist novel, but I want to kind of twist it a little bit and turn it a little bit. And so, uh, so yeah, sometimes I just pop up with an idea, but then other times I'll be watching the news and like, oh my god, that's so crazy! I got to work that into a story. Uh, so that's where a lot of my stuff comes from. Uh, but it goes through a long process. Like I, I, I um, I don't do outlines, but I don't fly by the seat of my pants either. I do a long, detailed synopsis which is usually two to three pages. And uh, basically that's me telling myself the story. And then once I can tell myself the story, then I feel like I can begin the book. Uh, a lot of times it doesn't stick to that synopsis, um, but the synopsis is sort of like a, 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 a roadmap that gives me an idea about where I wanna go with the tale. Do you know your ending before you get there? Or are you roughly, do you, in, in, in that synopsis, <laughs> yeah, do you have an ending? Most, yeah, most of the times I do. It can change though. Like I, I'll, I'll tell you, when I wrote the synopsis for Blacktop Wasteland, uh, and I, I'm not trying to spoil it for anybody who hasn't read it, um, but uh, I, I killed off the main character in the original. Like I, 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 I axed him. And when I was writing it, <laughs> I got so, I became so enamored with the character that I tried to figure out a way to save that character, which I ultimately I did in a way. Yes, and in a way they're, they're very changed. But and then so so with Razorblade Tears, there was a totally different ending that was very um, how can I say, very, very on the extreme end of Southern Gothic. There was a, there was an ending that uh, the I put it like this: the bad guys were uh, were 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 uh, being uh, being treated poorly by our main characters <laughs> over a long period. <laughs> And uh, okay. I remember sending that to my agent and, and he said, you know, I think you've got something here, but I mean, I don't want people to leave. I don't want people to close this book and, and be sick to their stomach. So I was like, all right, yeah. we'll change it. So all right. <laughs> so no prologue and no vomiting at the end, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, we have a question from Elise. Was this particular story inspired by something specific you read or saw in the news? Actually, this particular story was was inspired by a good friend of mine. I had a friend 
who uh, is one of my earliest classmates. We started kindergarten together, so we're about the same age. And about five years ago, he came out to his parents. Uh, we all knew he was gay. You know, it was no shock. We grew up with it. Uh, it was no big deal to us. But he decided to come out to his parents. And it didn't do really. It didn't go well. And I had a beer with him later on, and we were talking about it. And he said, you know, maybe I should have just kept it to myself. And I can't imagine how he felt saying that. But the way I felt hearing that as his friend was devastating. I can't imagine not being able to be the full version of yourself with people who are supposed to love you unconditionally. And so that always, that kind of stuck around in my mind. And then, this is funny, that's the funny part. Then I was having a conversation with a, a fellow writer, a guy named Todd Robinson, and we were texting or messaging back and forth. And he sent me a picture of the actor uh, Danny Trejo and the actor Ron Perlman. And these okay. are two older gentlemen, two men yep. of a certain age. And he sent me this picture and he's like, man, I'd love to see somebody write a book about these two guys. <laughs> and I thought about it. I said, huh, I, I, I wonder what that would look like. You know, these are guys that are, you know, in, in, the, in their characterizations and their acting, their characters are always tough. Their, their characters not to be messed with or trifled with, as they say. And so I wonder what that looks like. And so I eventually changed uh, some things about the characters. But that was my first um, inspiration for Ike and Buddy Lee. I uh, can see actually, that. I, I, Ike was, yeah, Ike was actually uh, Israel Ramirez. And then I changed it because I, 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 I wanted to do something. I wanted to talk about not just the, uh, the regret that these men had, but I did want to talk about the race and class issues. And, and I always write from a perspective that I'm more comfortable with, which is an African-American. And so I changed the character. I also changed the title. The original title was uh, The Avenging Devils. And it just didn't flow off of the tongue. And so I changed uh, the title to Raise Blade Tears. I had already written the line in the book Right. And then I was thinking about changing the title. I'm like, I got to come up with a title. And I remember reading that line. I'm like, oh, that's it. That's that's the title. So a lot of changes happened, but the nuts and bolts of the story were pretty much was there. Well, I'm glad you got rid of the prologue and I'm glad you changed the title because I think this has to, <laughs> for me, and for me, it's one of the best titles of a book that I've read this year. It's a, one of my best oh, books, but also so one much. of the best titles. So um, Joan is so asking, much. have you thought about writing a book about Ike's wife? Great question. Um, uh, Joan says, I found her to be an interesting character and would love to know more of her backstory. I think that she is going to show up in my next book. Oh. Because if you remember her day job is she's a nurse. Right. She's a nurse at a hospital. And I have this, I have this desire <laughs> to create an S.A. Cosby shared universe. Oh, so sure. I would love for characters to show up in my book. Like the, in the original draft of Raised by Tears, Bug from Black Tide Wasteland had a cameo, but then I changed an accent scene and I, I had to take him out. Um, so kind of like Faulkner, kind of like uh, Faulkner, create your own world. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Definitely. So because uh, he's mentioned, because uh, Ike talks about where he took his car, he takes it to Montage Motors, which is Bugs uh, uh, right. automobile shop. And I would love, for, I think Maya is going to show up. I'm working on a book right now that is tentatively titled All the Sinners Bleed. Um, and it's about a small Southern town. And it's about a character. He's the first black sheriff in a small Southern town. And on the one year anniversary of his election, there's a shooting at the school and a beloved High school teacher is killed by a former student. But when we find out that the high school teacher was a horrible person and he was involved with a serial killer. And so our sheriff has to figure that out while also navigating the racial and class issues that are going on in the town. Uh, wow. While all this is going on, he's also getting ready for a unite the right type of uh, march through his, his downtown town oh my God. Uh, area. Uh, and so I, yeah. And so I think Maya may make an appearance at a hospital scene there in the book. I would love to do that. Because I love I the idea of these characters, idea. like you said, like Faulkner. Yeah, and, and I love the idea of them interacting with each other. So yeah, I, I think I, I think that that that's a great idea. Be and, and especially because it's not like it, it, sometimes when writers bring in characters from other writers' novels into a book, for me anyway, it bumps me out of the reality. It seems to me that you bring right. in characters from your own books into other books. It just sort of encases them even more in the world that you've created, and I, I so I'm all I'm all for oh, that. Oh yeah, uh, Sean, which novel of yours do you like best and why? From Sarah, thank you for your time tonight. Um, oh my gosh. Sarah says, um, 
I will say very quickly, I, I still have a soft spot in my heart for Blacktop Baseland uh, because it meant so much to me personally. It was very cathartic for me. Uh, but I still love Razor Blade Tears. I love Ike and Buddy Lee. I think they're uh, I think they're my most interesting characters, but I love the whole the whole crew in, in Blacktop Wasteland. Yeah, yeah. And then Barry is asking, uh, um, the women and children always bear dire consequences for the actions of the male protagonists. Is this a purposeful technique? Great question. Yeah, uh, because I think, in, especially like Blacktop Wasteland and Raised by Tears, these men who are, are, have difficulty communicating, who have a difficulty expressing uh, 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 you know, frailty or expressing their sensitivity, their actions draw their loved ones in. And so that's the curse of tragic and toxic masculinity. And so um, I use that as a narrative piece, A, to up the ante. I mean, like, you know, we're trying to tell an exciting story, but also B, that replicates or that resembles what happens in real life. A lot of times it's the wives and children that are left to pick up the pieces after a, a man who isn't able to deal with his emotions does something, whether he thinks it's right or wrong. Um, and so, yeah, that's definitely, I do want to work on something one day with a, a, a female protagonist, um, just because I want to talk about the other side of that story. But there's so many great female uh, crime writers right now. Uh, I feel like I'll, I'll wait a little bit because they're doing gangbusters. Uh, there's people like Kelly Garrett, Nikki right. Wilson, uh, uh, Yasmin yes, uh, Alcindor, uh, Megan Abbott. Oh my God, Jennifer Hillier. So there's so many great female crime writers I'll take. A, I'll, I'll wait a little bit on, bit on that, but I would like to do that and talk about some other issues uh, that are specific to that uh, type of weed. Um, uh, Tim is asking, uh, do you still find excitement in the same place that you did when you first started writing and getting published? Yes, it never gets old. And the day it gets old, I'll stop writing. Every time I'm writing and I write a good line or I come up with a good scenario, or I come up with some snappy dialogue, I feel just like I felt when I was 12 years old. I wrote this really, really bad werewolf story. It was really <laughs> bad, but I enjoyed coming up with it. It was terrible. It was awful. But no, I, 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 I feel that at all. You know, to be honest, it has become more, I, it is different than when I was just writing without deadlines. But that being said, the act of writing still brings me pleasure. It still brings me solace. It comforts me when I'm in pain and it excites me when I'm happy. And like I said, the day that that stops, I'll, I'll stop writing. That, that's a, a great way, a great way to encompass almost everything that we've talked about um, tonight. Uh, I think I have, uh, as long as we're talking about Megan Abbott, Daniel just posted um, <laughs> registration for a webinar for, for, for Megan. And um, let's see. And, and of course, Attica Locke, another one who writes amazing. Yes, um, incredible. Incredible writer, just awesome. Um, amazing writer. writer, amazing writer. Let me um, just ask one last question. I think I saw posted somewhere that um, there's a, a, a company you've, you've sold the rights to both books for film rights yeah. already. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. To the same to yes. the same yes, place. Can, mm -hmm. can you tell us a little about no, two that? Two different companies. Yeah. So Blacktop Wasteland was sold to a company called Picture Start. Um, and in conjunction with uh, John Legend, the musician's production company, uh, there's a script that's been written for that. I got to read it. It's really good. It's written oh, good. by a guy named Virgil Williams, who is, uh, was the co-writer of the script for Mudbound. He's an Academy Award nominated writer. Um, and then also Paramount Players, in conjunction with Jerry Bruckheimer Films, bought the rights for Raise Blade Tears. And they have a script that's being written as well. So I'm crossing my fingers before next year is out, I'll, I'll be able to turn on the TV or go to the theater and see uh, Based On by S.A. Cosby. I can scream uh, like a rooster. <laughs> and and I will, as I said at the beginning, and, and I will be screaming with you. I wish, I, I'm I'm so happy and excited and, and for all your success. I'm sure there's gonna be much more coming. And thank you for spending um, your evening with us. Um, I really appreciate it. Daniel, I don't know if I'm coming back to you or, or not, but thank you, Sean. There you are. Thank you for having me. It was so much fun. Thank you. We are thrilled to have you. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you so much. You have a great night. Yep. All right. Six. Bye.